I was raised in Toledo, Ohio. I know you're thinking, I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> and my mom and dad were concerned about the schools in Toledo, and so they enrolled us in a private little Lutheran school. I remember my two main teachers, two German men, Rudolf Ranke and Karl Obst. And it was the tradition there at the school that every Christmas season, they would have us recite Luke 2, the whole chapter, the Christmas story. And because my dad knew that we had memorized that, before we would open gifts at Christmas, uh, he would have us recite Luke 2. And there's one particular vignette in that story that always captured my my imagination as a little boy. It's that moment where the shepherds are out in the dark, in the cold, caring for, watching, guarding their sheep, and suddenly an angel appears. Imagine experiencing this. They're afraid. The angel tells them they don't need to be afraid because this angel actually has good news. It is that a Savior is going to be born in Bethlehem. And suddenly then there are with the one angel a multitude of angels and they're praising God and singing glory to God in the highest and peace on whom his favor rests. Well, there's one single important, significant biblical word in that announcement that I want us to focus on this morning. I don't often preach from one word, but I'm going to do that this morning. It's the word glory. Glory defines who God is. Glory tells you who you are. Glory tells you what you hunger for and what you need. And glory tells you how that hunger will finally be satisfied. Let me read for you Luke 2. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the flock, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among whom those with whom he is pleased. I am deeply persuaded that that word glory captures the essence, the importance, the significance, the hopefulness of the Christian story. Well, you say, Paul, please explain. Well, it's going to, I want to take you on a bit of a journey. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we human beings are hardwired for glory. We love glorious things. That's why you like that seven-layer chocolate mousse cake. At least I do. That's why you love that triple overtime NBA game. That's why you like that beautiful piece of music or the drama of a well-written, well-performed movie or the beauty of a glorious painting or the delicacy of a human kiss. We love glorious things. And God has placed us in a world that's a glory display. You wake up every morning to glorious things. The rising of the sun is a beautiful, glorious thing. The inexhaustible wings of a hummingbird the whistle of the wind through the leaves, the individuality of a single snowflake, the lumbering gait of an elephant, 
the sunset with its gorgeous colors washing across the waves of an ocean. The grandeur of a redwood tree. We're, we're surrounded by glorious things. We live in this glory display called earth. And God has given us glory gates, our eyes and our ears and our nose and our ability to touch and our emotions and our brain and our heart so we can take in these glories. And I don't know whether you have thought about this or not, but every day in some way you search, you hunt for, you look for a, some kind of glory that would satisfy the glory longing in your heart, something that would bring you joy, something that would bring you happiness, something that would bring you hope, something that would make you content, something that would finally give you peace. That word that is mentioned in that announcement of the angels, peace. We're hardwired for glory. You know, animals aren't like this. The penguins don't score one another as they dive off the ice into the water. The rhino doesn't say to the zebra, dude, where'd you get that amazing striped coat? It is awesome. But we do those things because we're we're hardwired for glory. We love glorious things. We're, we're oriented to glory and we're always hungry for some kind of glorious thing to satisfy this craving, this longing that's in the heart of every human being. If you're alive, that longing is inside of you. Well, here's a second step in our journey. It means that your life is a glory war. Your life is one big glory war. You say, Paul, we're, we're here to celebrate Christmas. What are you talking about war? Well, listen to what I'm about to say. There are only two types of glory that exist. There's God glory, the ultimate, incalculable glory of God, and there's sign glory, S-I-G-N glory. You see, every created thing, every beautiful vista of creation is meant to be a finger pointing us to the glory of God. Every created thing is a sign pointing you to the one glory that will finally satisfy your heart. And so as you're looking at that, that single petal from a blossom, and it's not just pink, but there's 70 shades of pink coursing across that, that, that's meant to be a finger pointing you to the glory of the one who made it. That sunset is meant to be a finger pointing you to the glory of God. Now here's what this means. Created things have no ability whatsoever to satisfy your heart. They're not intended to do that. Creation is meant to point you to the place where your heart will be satisfied. Listen, your marriage will never satisfy your heart. Your children will never satisfy your heart. Your job will never satisfy your heart. That new house or that new car will never satisfy your heart. That ultimate once-in-a-lifetime vacation will never satisfy your heart. Men, that 48-ounce cow cowboy ribeye steak will never satisfy your heart. It'll just make you sick. <laughs> Don't finish that thing. You're crazy. It'll never, those things will never satisfy your heart. And yet, you and I are always asking creation to do what it was never intended to do. We ask our job to satisfy our hearts. We ask our friends to satisfy our hearts. We ask our marriage to satisfy our hearts. It won't happen. I had a dear wife in counseling say these words to me. They seem too bad at first, but when you think about them, 
they change. She said, all I ever wanted was a husband who would make me happy. I thought, that man's cooked. <laughs> because no imperfect human being has the ability to produce in you lasting, sturdy contentment and joy. Listen, asking your husband to be the true source of your deepest happiness is turning your husband into your own personal Messiah. It won't work. And we're constantly looking to creation to do what creation was never intended to do. Creation will never be your savior. It won't. What that leaves you is discouraged and frustrated and angry and fearful and depressed. And some of you are suffering that right now because you're looking to creation to do what it was never meant to do and it's come up short for you again and again and you're discouraged. Sometimes you feel like giving up. Well, a couple of illustrations. Do you remember that famous miracle of Jesus where he took a little boy's lunch and turned it into a meal for 5,000 people with leftovers? When Jesus was done with that miracle, the crowd wanted to make him their king. And they ran after him and Jesus actually withdrew himself and hid. And when they finally found him, the crowd was confused. And he said this to them. And when they asked, why did you hide from us? He said, you only want me to be king because you had your bellies filled. And then he said this. You ate the bread, but you didn't see the sign. Jesus' words. You ate the bread, but you didn't see the sign. He's saying, don't you realize the physical bread was meant to be a finger, a sign, pointing you to the ultimate bread that will satisfy you. I'm the bread of life. Jesus is saying, it's only me that ever will ha has the ability to satisfy the longing of your heart. You just don't, you don't need an endless buffet. You need me. You're missing the point. Or pretend with me that I have young children. You can look at me and know that I don't any longer have young children. Why are you laughing? It's so hurtful. And pretend that uh, in January of a certain year, I announced to my children that we're going to go to Disney World. <laughs> Somebody in the crowd got excited all of a sudden. And I get out my, my iPad and I show them the entertainment glories of Disney World. They are so excited. Their imaginations are bursting. And I tell them that because Disney World is expensive and we want to do the full experience that we're going to have to save money all year. So I'm going to say no to expenditures. And throughout the year, they, they come to me wanting me to spend money on something. I remind them that we're going to Disney World. And I, I get on my iPad again. I show them all the entertainment glories of Disney World. Well, it's now June. And we've packed the car. And we're getting ready to take this long, long road trip to Disney World. If you want to experience human depravity, take a long family road trip. <laughs> you won't just experience your children's, you'll experience yours. And we finally, after this long, exhausting trip, get to that location where the first sign says, Disney World, 120 miles. And I pull off the road and I tell my family to unpack, and I say, we're here. If you're my children, what are you thinking? You're thinking, finally, it has happened. You knew it was coming. Dad has lost his mind. <laughs> Your children instinctively know that sign 
has no ability whatsoever to deliver what Disney World can deliver. It has no ability at all to deliver the expansive, wonderful, entertainment glories of Disney World. The sign is not the thing. The sign points to the thing. And if you ask that sign to do for you what Disney World can do for you, you will be miserably disappointed. Welcome to creation. Creation was not meant to give you the deepest satisfaction, the deepest contentment, the deepest joys and hope of your life. And when you look to created things to do what they were not designed to do, you always end up disappointed. You always end up frustrated. You always end up hurt. And ultimately, you end up hopeless. Some of you are already experiencing this. That's why I'm convinced that the song of the angels gets to the heart of the Christmas story. Hear this, Jesus is the glory of God come to earth. Glory comes to earth. The glory of Jesus is not one aspect of his character. It's a summary of his character. He's glorious in love. He's glorious in mercy. He's glorious in grace. He's glorious in forgiveness. He's glorious in patience. He's glorious in power. He's glorious in faithfulness. He's glorious in sovereignty. He's glorious. He's glorious. He's glorious. He's glorious. glorious. And this is the shocking reality of the Christmas story that this glorious one, this one who shines with inestimable glory, was willing to subject himself to the harsh realities of life in this broken world. Glory was willing to connect himself, to subject himself, to submit himself to inglorious things, hard, painful things. The suffering of Jesus didn't begin at his crucifixion. The suffering of Jesus began at his birth. Imagine this glorious one was born in a stable. His infant body laid in a feeding trough. Shards of straw pushing against his tender infant skin. The Bible tells us he never had a place to lay his head. Never had a house of his own. Mocked, despised, rejected literally every day of his life. Condemned in an unjust, fixed trial, tortured in ways that are beyond inhumane, hung on a cross to be crucified on a hill of death outside of the city with a couple criminals, placed in a borrowed tomb rose after three days to conquer sin and death. Why would Jesus do this? Why would this glorious one subject himself to this? Well, 2 Corinthians 5.15 tells us. This is my paraphrase. It says, listen carefully, that Jesus came so that those who live would no longer live for themselves. This is what sin does to us. Sin causes us to shrink the field of our concern down to the claustrophobic confines of my wants, my needs, my feelings. Sin makes life all about us. 
Sin makes me put in the center of everything. Sin reduces me to one who's demanding and critical and entitled. I want, I want, I want, I want. I want children who would say to me, I will forthwith go and obey, Father, because you, sir, are wise. I want a wife who says, of course I agree with you, Paul. I've lived with the glory that is you. I want to be able to drive on roads that are paid for by other citizens who choose not to use them. I want chocolate at ready reach all the time. Dark, please. I want, I want, I want. You will never understand the Christmas story unless you understand there is no glory to you and me as sinners more seductive, more attractive, more deceptive. Are you ready for this? Than the glory of self. It's self-glory that captures us and addicts us. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And we attach our happiness to what we want, when we want it, how we want it, where we want it, and who we want to deliver it to us. Self-glory will trouble and destroy a marriage. Self-glory makes parenting a battleground. Self-glory makes you complaining and demanding and critical. Self-glory makes you hard to work with or hard to work for. Self-glory creates tension between you and your neighbor. Self-glory makes friendships exhausting. Self-glory will cause you to spend yourself into debt because you feel entitled to more and more and more. Self-glory will make you endlessly dissatisfied. Self-glory is the ultimate human dysfunction. You can trace almost all of the sad, broken trouble of the human culture to self-glory. So here's the beauty, the glory of the Christmas story. Glory came to earth to rescue us from us. To finally liberate us from our addiction to ourselves. And through his completely righteous life, and his acceptable death, and his victorious resurrection to unite us to the one glory that would finally satisfy our hearts. That's beautiful, good news. Jesus had to be willing to leave the splendor of eternity to subject himself to things that we would not want in our lives so that we would finally be liberated and finally be connected to the one who alone has the ability to satisfy our hearts. So we would finally quit asking creation to do what it has no ability to do. a beautiful story. If I were to watch the last six weeks, the video of the last six weeks of your life, if I would watch the places where you are happy and the places where you're sad, the places where you're content and the places where you're angry, Where would I conclude you're hooking your hope to? Sign glory or God glory? How much would I see you captured by the glory of self? You know, it's in all of us. You, you know this. That's why you get mad in traffic. Can you relate to that? You're sitting in your car thinking, don't they know I have somewhere to go? 
Well, they don't. It's why you don't like it when somebody disagrees with you. You can feel your ears get warm and your chest tighten. It's like you think it's a capital crime when somebody eats the last cookie, the one you had your name on it. Or you know that moment when your husband or wife has asked you to go to the uh, grocery store to get just something simple, a, bar, a jar of salsa. That's the thing that we need, you need for dinner. And so you stop on the way home from work at the grocery store. You're hoping it will be empty. And you grab your jar of salsa. All the self-checkout aisles are broken down. And there's only one checkout aisle that's left. And it's empty. There's a lady waiting to wait on you. The belt is empty. And you run toward that checkout aisle with your jar of salsa and your heart full of hope. And a woman goes in front of you with a cart with 150 items. You already love that woman. And she starts slowly pulling items out of the cart as if she's surprised they're there. You can feel the rage building inside of you. She finally gets all of the items on the belt and then she pulls out 100 coupons and starts attaching them to items. By then you're almost a cycle killer. And then when she's finally got all the coupons taken care of and it's time to pay, she's acting like she's surprised that she has to pay. And she announces that she's going to pay with a check. Who buys groceries with a check anymore? And she pulls out a purse the size of a camping tent for a family of six and opens it up and starts looking for a checkbook. Her top half of her body disappears, it's so big. She starts pulling things out of her purse. She's not pulling out makeup, she's pulling out children and small dogs. <laughs> By then you wanna share something with that woman, but it wouldn't be Jesus. <laughs> now you know why you're laughing? Because you get it, because you've been there. It's the beauty of this story we're now thinking about, that Jesus came to liberate us from our insane addiction to us and introduce us to the ultimate joys of living for something bigger than us, the ultimate joys of living for a glory greater than ours, the satisfying glory that will capture our hearts, and we can finally know true, inner, sturdy, lasting peace that nothing can take away. <clears throat> Luella and I had a son that just didn't understand the concept of gifts. It happened Christmas after Christmas, birthday after birthday. We would buy him something that we thought he would enjoy, some kind of toy. He'd tear open the box, discard the gift, and play with the box. It made me insane. So one Christmas, I decided to go on the quintessential quest for the ultimate gift. One that I knew that he couldn't resist, that he would actually play with. And we found this big truck that it was just the kind of thing he enjoyed at that time. And I just knew he would love this. And so that moment came at Christmas when he had that gift in front of him. I was so excited. And he tore it open and he got it out and he actually began to play with it. I had such feelings of victory. I went into the kitchen to get something to drink. Uh, had a conversation with one of my other members of my family and I came out. And he was sitting in the box. Now you say, you may be saying, why is Paul telling us this cute family story at the end of this talk? 
Well, you have been given the greatest, most amazing gift that could ever be given. This is a gift that's glorious from every perspective. It's the only gift ever given that has the power to change you and everything about you. It's the one gift that keeps giving and giving and giving. It's inexhaustible. It's a gift that every human being needs, whether they realize it or not. It's a gift you could never have earned, you could never achieve, you could never deserve. It's the ultimate glorious gift of the glory and grace of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gift of gifts. But you know what makes me sad this morning? In the face of being given that gift, there are people in this room who are still content to play with the box. The box is not the thing. The box has no ability to deliver to you the thing. You're still a bit obsessed with your own glory. You still ask creation to do what it was not intended to do. When God looked down on you and me and said, I don't want my children to live in this dysfunction. I will touch earth with glory. And I will rescue them. And I will unite them to myself. So they may know peace forever and ever and ever. What a beautiful story. I would ask you this morning, are you holding on to that gift with both hands? Have you surrendered your heart to this gift? Or are you still sadly content to play with the box? Let's pray. Lord, I know for myself I often get it wrong. I often look to some created thing to do for me what it was never meant to do. And I get hurt and discouraged and frustrated and angry. And I, I would confess that this morning and I would ask for your forgiveness and your help. I would pray the same for my brothers and sisters. May we not attach our identity, our meaning and purpose, our hope, our security into, th into things that cannot deliver. May we find our hope in you. May we confess our self-glory and cry out to you for the freedom, the liberation that only you can give. Thank you for the ultimate gift of gifts. We pray these things for the sake of everyone that's hearing these words and ultimately for your glory. Oh, Savior, oh, King, Jesus. Amen. God bless.